Thank you very much, Dr. Fulkerson, for that warm welcome and for having me here at the Henry Center at Trinity International University. It's a visit long looked forward to, oft postponed, and it's still slightly difficult to believe that it's taking place and that this lecture is actually happening. So if suddenly you get afflicted with a sense of unreality or you see that I am, you will know the reason why. <laughs> the association of law and creation is a familiar enough one. Law is the principle of regularity and predictability that allows us to speak of the created world as an ordered and rational whole. But when we discuss law in the context of ethics or politics as a norm that we are free, metaphysically, to heed or not to heed, but are bound by, it's often supposed that we must be talking of law in some quite different sense. <coughs> now, what follows is an argument for the consistency of the idea of law conceived within a theological context. The term law, in its different fields of application, is an analogous one. And its relation, relation to creation persists across all its uses. Let me begin from one of the greatest of the Hebrew Psalms, in which creation and law are famously set alongside one another. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. In the first stanza, the poet reviews the celestial phenomena, the succession of days and nights, the silent communicativeness of the heavens, whose voice goes out through all the world, their words to the end of the world. And he concludes with a long passage about the sun, emerging in splendor each morning like a bridegroom ready to be married and careering through the sky like an athlete. And then in the second stanza, the theme changes suddenly. The law of Adonai is perfect, reviving the soul. The law is then passed through a prism of different aspects using a set of terms collated from the book of Deuteronomy. It is instruction, precept, command, fear in the sense of authority, judgment. And then the third stanza makes another new beginning, assuming a personal tone and closing with a prayer, cleanse thou me from my hidden faults. Now, to an older generation of biblical critics, this structure presented a question of literary integrity. Arthur Weiser is typical in his blunt assertion. Psalm 19 consists of two independent songs, which in subject matter, mood, language, and meter differ from each other so much that they cannot be composed by the same author. And behind that judgment lay a number of scholarly assumptions that tended to regard the two themes of the psalm, creation and law, as belonging to entirely different circles of Israel's cultural life, and saw these as indicated by the use of different divine names, Elohim in the first stanza and Adonai, in the second and third. Those assumptions today, on the whole, do not command the confidence that they used to. But this prejudice in favor of the disunity of the psalm was reinforced, and perhaps, I'm inclined to think, originally 
generated by an older Western tradition of reading the first stanza entirely as a piece on its own. As far back as the beginning of the 18th century, the poet Joseph Addison's verse paraphrase of the stanza, the spacious firmament on high and all the bright ethereal sky, very much admired in his day and still sung as a hymn, uh, presented an, an epitome of Enlightenment natural theology. We notice how Addison modifies the sequence of phenomena that the original looks at. The, se the celestial appearances come in a different order. In order to give priority to the sun, which comes right up the front, uh, which the Hebrew poet had placed at the end of the list. The unwearied sun from day to day doth his creator's power display. And then, feeling perhaps that the psalmist had not squeezed all he might have done out of the heavenly bodies, Addison adds some celestial observations of his own. The moon appears nightly to the listening earth repeats the story of her birth. And the stars are given four whole lines. And what they do, in effect, is confirm the tidings as they roll. And then the heavenly silence appears at the end to explain that what makes natural entities communicative about God is the ear of inductive reason which infers from existence that the hand that made us is divine. At which point Addison puts his pen down and stops. Now I go into that poem because I think it reveals the difficulties that stand in that way of reading the psalm. Uh, for the Hebrew poet, the sun has a position and a role entirely of its own, but Addison bundles the sun up together with the day and the night and the moon and the stars. The sky, too, in the original poem, uh, had revealed something quite distinctive to it. God's kabod, his brightness, that is the weight of his presence. Glory and weight are the same idea in Hebrew. While the lesson Addison draws from the sky could be learned just as well from studying a leaf or an underwater organism of some kind, namely that God is the efficient cause of all natural objects. Addison's name is attached to a very pleasant walk around the grounds of Magdalen College, Oxford. The walk follows a circular route, and Addison's natural theology is shaped in just the same way. It always brings you back to the same point. The fact that these things exist is a testimony to the God who made them. The psalm, on the other hand, follows a very definite direction. From the sky, first of all, the evidence of God's presence to the earth, his brightness or weight, to the day and night that display the orderly succession of events, and then to the sun that presides over all that lives, energizes, quickens everything with warmth, concluding there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. You can see, if I may say so, why this poem was unintelligible to an Englishman. <laughs> From the sun, it's then a short step to the opening words of the second stanza, Torah Adonai, the law of the Lord, because Torah is the sun of the moral firmament. It gives energy. It gives spatial and temporal relations to human undertakings. It gives joy and celebration. It gives light. It is the measure of everything. 
nothing is hidden from it. And we desire it as we desire life itself. Now, unless we can follow the poet in his analogy between the law and the sun, we shall not be able to follow him into the third stanza, where he takes his second decisive step. Moreover, by them is thy servant taught. And we shall come back to that moment in a little while. To speak of creation is to speak of a regularity and predictability that constitutes a world. We could not speak of a creation without a law, for we would not be able to speak of a world that was in any way inhabitable. A world with an order that could be participated in as a structure that could define and support the project of our lives. So to believe in creation as law is to admit that our own practical existence is beholden to this order of things. It's to discover creation, therefore, as a matter for our praise and thanks. And that is the existential condition for thinking about creation, forming the idea at all, as opposed simply to thinking about nature, for which we're by no means bound to give praise and thanks. Law and creation are thus mutually implicating ideas. Law, the inner coherence of creation, creation, the concrete embodiment of law as a world. Creation is the womb in which a whole world of law-governed realities and possibilities comes to birth. Law secures the resources of creation for practical realization. And in order to speak of this interrelation of law and creation, we then have to introduce a third idea, which encapsulates the possibilities for life and action that creation as law offers. History appears as the horizon on which the realities of creation on the one hand, the possibilities of law on the other, converge into a new and further realization. Moreover, by them is thy servant taught. Now, the wedge driven by the Enlightenment between fact and value, left it without this perception of creation as full of possibilities. Natural observation, it thought, had the goal of tracing the many given regularities of creation. And all those three words are important. Observation observes regularities. It observes them as objectively given out there in the world, not invented, and there are very many of them. But these many given regularities can come together to form a world only as they're thought of as a coherent whole. And to think of that requires a unifying point of reference that will make some whole out of the many. The methodological regime of the natural sciences, which we commonly name reduction, deliberately removes that reference point. And if science is seen wholly and exclusively from this point of view, then it becomes a self-conscious abstraction from the world. As it brackets out as the phrase has it, the promises of prosperity and living well that once accompanied the ancient search for wisdom. So it brackets out all teleological structures and purposes which depend for their intelligibility on a rational coherence unifying all things, observers and observed. 
One might even say that science so conceived sets aside the need for interpretation of reality and replaces it with a simple demand for the facts of natural occurrence to be described. We are thus faced with the choice of two different laws. The law that springs from fact on the one hand and describes fact, and the law that constitutes the value of human existence on the other hand, an object of appreciation and a framework for endeavor. But in my view, the reductive method is not a sufficient account of what natural science does and attempts. In the first place, no fact can be a fact in the world without relations to other facts. The regularity which science looks for when it studies facts the regularity by which one fact follows another and then follows it again another time round when you repeat the experiment, that regularity is not itself a bare fact. It is a relation of facts that confers and implies a meaning on the facts. It relates a meaning such as cause, uh, Fact A is the cause, fact B is the effect. When a scientist formulates a hypothesis, A causes B on the basis of observations, then the scientist has taken a distinct step beyond reductive observation, a step towards interpretation, to finding meaning in these successive recurrences. And meaning already contains the germ of normativity in itself. Meaning asserts its authority over nonsense. Not to think or speak nonsense, one could say, is the most elementary norm there is. And the normative meaning of such a thing as a law of regularity in science is a necessary accompaniment of the relations in which we stand as historical existence to the order of facts. And I say relations because we stand not in one relation to facts, but in at least two. On the one hand, we are necessarily part of the order of facts. Our existence is a fact among other facts, perfectly capable of observation and noting in some scientist's book. And we are also conscious of that order of facts of which we are a part and find meaning in it. So the two types of law, the law of fact and the law of value, converge in our experience. Value is a corollary of fact, not an implication of it, as when one draws a conclusion from two concrete facts to reach a third fact. But a necessary accompaniment of the concept of fact once the fact is embedded in its relations to a whole structure and order of other facts. Our position in relation to facts is, as we say, free, which means that active participation is our meaning in the world, the intelligibility of our form of existence, and active participation involves self-disposal. But what's the differential that distinguishes this active participation in a world constituted by natural occurrence? That is the question addressed by faith in creation and law. Law is an advance on meaning. Moreover, by them is thy servant taught. The psalmist goes on. We might say law is when meaning becomes teaching. The imminent intelligibility 
of the order of the universe becomes a message to some who will understand it. Regularities and structures as such imply no teaching. But when we discover the facticity of existence as one among the facts of the universe, we discover that the order laid out before us is an order for us, an order which invites our willing engagement. Who can tell how oft he goes wrong, the psalmist goes on. Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Nothing, we were told, is hidden. It's the same word in Hebrew as in English, from the heat of the sun. Nothing is hidden from the universe of meaning. Yet something about me can be hidden from me. But when I discover that something about myself is hidden from myself, that discovery dawns on me with a very distinctive experience, the experience of shame, the awareness of not being in full possession of myself. I discover that my self-knowledge is not just a fact of the universe, but is a law to me which makes a demand on me which I cannot refuse. Together with the regularities of the self, I thought I could be a mere observer of there springs to life a law, know thyself. And in my consciousness of being held in an order that governs my existence, I discover the moral norm, the requirement that I shall act according to what I have been given to be. At its most fundamental level, the poet holds, all law is Torah Adonai, the law of the Lord. Special forms of law, including the laws we make for ourselves, lie downstream from this original gift of law devolved on us by the sovereignty of God, but always dependent on its authority. We encounter law as we encounter God, as always already there, in place before we notice it. We have been active, we have made plans, we have carried them out, and in doing so we've taken the law of creation for granted. It rules us now because whatever we've come to be is the result of having been law governed. We cannot invent or discover law, but we can awaken to it for the first time. And that awakening is what confers on our active exertions the character of true action, freedom. The law that determines us is not like the law that governs the day and the night, simply a set of conditions. It's a communication to us about our conditions, inviting, demanding our agreement. That agreement we can refuse, though we cannot escape the conditions that we refuse. And even in refusing them, we give proof that they do not merely condition us, but command us. Law becomes the form in which God determines our active life personally. The great political theorists of the Counter-Reformation uh, attempted to clarify this point <coughs> by arguing that law is at one and the same time an expression of reason, and an expression of will. The law is God's reason constituting the logic of our practical lives, but this reason is also his will expressed to us as the self-disclosure of an acting person to acting persons. And these two factors in law were traditionally distinguished as natural law on the one hand, divine law and divine command on the other. Uh, but that distinction is often misunderstood. They're not two types of law, let alone, as modern ethics textbooks like to tell us, two theories about law. They are two features of the logic of creation, which is at once the gift of an objective reality and the gift of a freedom for its possibilities.
In the second creation narrative in Genesis, Adonai Elohim forms Adam of dust. He plants a garden, causes trees to grow in it, waters it with a river, and puts Adam there to till it and keep it. And then there's a shift in the narrative as Adonai Elohim speaks a word of command. You may eat freely of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Up to this point, everything Adonai Elohim has done seems sensible, charming, and aesthetically satisfying. But with this speech, an arbitrary and seemingly ungracious note enters his dispositions. No reason is given for the forbidden tree. So we ask, as we are meant to ask, why not? And we're not answered. Because the whole point we have to learn is that there is no answer to that question, just as there is no answer to the question of why God said, let there be light in the first place. If the command is mysterious, it is mysterious in just the way that the fact of creation itself is mysterious. Creation contains reasons for everything that happens in it. It is an ensemble of reasons, but it does not itself rest on reasons. It is the reasons that it contains. There may be convincing reasons why the fruit of one tree is edible and the fruit of another tree is inedible, but there is no prior reason why there should be a distinction between edible and inedible trees in the first place. We expect our reasons to be an infinite chain, something explaining everything until the explanations disappear over the horizon. So, when we're denied that expectation and the horizon suddenly is closed to us, we're made to feel the jolt of a new beginning as the search for reasons is preempted by this command. The preemption means simply that Adam is spoken to. The law is no longer his framework, which he can understand. It is his summons to rule his ways according to it. As such, it neither precludes nor promises that Adam may come to see reasons for the commands he does not now see. The point is simply that a personal relation to the Creator as commanded to Commander does not wait upon an understanding of all the reasons there are for everything. So as creatures, we are bound, like Adam, to make our lives within the context of this ordered universe without a full understanding of every significant feature that it contains. It is constantly to be explored, constantly to be learned. Qua scientist, Adam asks and finds reasons. Qua human being, he directs his attention to a particular demand made of him at a particular moment, living and acting in a state of real but not comprehensive knowledge. Just as existence is not a mechanical participation in the universe, so it's not a purely exploratory relation to the universe. It involves an active self-disposal in a community of freedom. And of course, it is that very freedom and the exercise of it that grounds the experimental method which distinguishes science from speculation. Science, in other words, has its own roots deeply buried in uh, freedom and in history. Famously, Francis Bacon described the engagement of science with nature rhetorically as torturing nature to make it give an account of itself. Now that rhetoric was a profound mistake, uh, absolutely encapsulating it seems to me, the voluntarist misunderstandings of knowledge. Experiment is not an assault on the natural order. It's a participation in it. 
that responds to the command given to human beings in nature to know nature. But how does that command, which is itself a regularity of nature, a predictable occurrence, form part of the universe of scientific regularities? How is the scientist's law of vocation to find things out homogeneous with the laws the scientist finds out? Failure to answer that question is what makes the scientist look to Bacon like a torturer. As a human being, he lacks the initial relation to creation, which he just goes at, as it were. That is not a good account of what science, of how science is exercised. The fundamental compatibility of freedom with created order is most clearly seen in the fact that freedom can be exercised wrongly. The very notion of a freedom misused assumes the possibility of a true and respectful use. That is to say, a use that is determined by the created order that it attends to. And that allows us to see the connection of creation and law in a further light. An ancient dogmatic tradition used to measure the anthropological significance of different cultural institutions and practices by the narrative of creation and fall. So, did marriage, government, private property, or whatever, belong to the state of human innocence? Or did they presuppose sin and the corruption of the world? The answers are different in different cases, obviously. Now, pose that question to law, and we are bound to discover that law is anthropologically basic. It belongs in the Garden of Eden. Still innocent and unfallen, Adam wakes up to law as command, to the alternative of a good use and a bad use of his freedom. That is, law is not something we could experience only in a state of guilt. Yet subsequently, law becomes highlighted as the site of human experience, in which guilt reveals itself. And that is the sense in which St. Paul says, the law appears after the promise, added because of transgressions in Galatians. It was law as command that showed up sin's effect because the sight of awareness of the difference between what we are and what we're meant to be. Law becomes the voice of creation in condemnation, a value, a created value that maintains itself against the actualities of our living and acting. There are two complementary and contrasting relation ways we speak of the role of law in this function. Paul, on the one hand, can speak of the law's ineffectiveness insofar as the law was impotent because of the flesh, he says in Romans 8. But he also contrasts the law with flesh. The law is spiritual while I am fleshly, a slave under sin's authority. So we are prevented by Paul from thinking of the value of the law as somehow unreal a mere ideal in the face of the real reality of unlawful behavior. The door is closed against what I call an unmitigated realism of a pessimistic kind. The act of sin has no real value or meaning. Reality, which is the object of all practical reasoning, is displayed to us in law. If what I do is what I wish not to do, Paul goes on, I recognize the goodness of law. 
We may view our conduct objectively, like behavioral scientists observing animal behavior under stress, and observe that the law has no purchase on that conduct. But as soon as we speak practically as subjects of our own actions, we then have to say that it is our behavior that has no purchase on the reality of the law. Suppose, for example, I impatiently push a child aside when it's in my way, and the child falls and hurts itself. Looking back on that event, I will say, I cannot think what I was doing. And that judgment is precisely right. I can offer various accounts of how it happened. I misjudged the force of my movement. I, I didn't see where the child was standing, and so on and so on. But even if all these accounts are correct, they do not explain what I have done. I do not know what I am doing, for I do not do what I wish to do, but what I hate. My deed has become incomprehensible to me, hidden. And that is the cause of my shame. Guilt is an objective knowledge that what one has done is open to condemnation. Shame is a subjective lack of knowledge of what one has oneself done in which there is only the failure of coherent action to encounter. So sinful behavior can be described and defined only in terms of the goodness that it falls short of, the care that should have been taken and wasn't, and so on. And in this case, too, the law is the voice of creation. The goodness of created order strikes us most especially when we've lost practical touch with it. When we find ourselves in the situation where everything is upset, the landmarks that tell us what we're doing are swept away. And that was how John of Patmos came to appreciate the beauty of the creation. The sea of chaos lay quietened before God's heavenly throne. Its surface was like crystal, and the response of all sentient and intelligent being to that beautiful order was both predictable and joyful, a repeated aesthetic celebration. But the context of that vision was a reflection on failure, on the inconsistency, the disarray of the churches of Asia Minor in their trials. Creation came into clear perspective in the light of their instability and insecurity. So the opening vision of the main part of the apocalypse falls into two parts in which the second part casts a shadow back over the first part. In the hand of the one who sat on the throne is a sealed scroll, which no one could open, a text unreadable, unintelligible within the terms of the knowledge of creation. History, the sphere of purposeful and free action, cannot be read in terms of creation's beauty and regularity. And the prophet tells us that he wept. Because the order of creation was frustrated by the unintelligible mystery of the scroll of actual events. For joy, order, and intelligibility are all indissolubly connected. We rejoice in what we can grasp, and what we can grasp is ordered coherence. And John was conscious of the dichotomy in his own and the church's existence between the goodness he loved and contemplated and the threateningly unintelligible character of the freedom of the practical mind. And that put joy and creation outside his reach. It constituted, as it were, a standing promise of intelligibility which remained unfulfilled and indeed subverted by the unintelligibility of history. We can, of course, confer 
order on historical events retrospectively. We can narrate them in ways that allow their sequential logic to appear. Historical narrative makes sense. There are enough broad generalizations about human actions and reactions that make some historical accounts more persuasive than others. But when you get down to the bottom of it, the judicious historian never imagines that history could be predicted on the basis of those generalizations. Within limits, we make narrative sense of the past. Within limits, we form sensible purposes with reasonable but not certain expectations of how they may turn out. <laughs>